These are the planes that won wars. Proud veterans of the days when heroes fought in the skies. They're like time machines. It seems you grab the controls, you've got that instant touch back to the past. In hangars and workshops across Britain, engineers and enthusiasts are fighting a desperate duel against corrosion. It's only glued on. I'm sure it'll be all right. And the clock. I'll be pretty gutted if we don't make it. Their mission? To return historic military aircraft to the skies. The hardest thing is finding the parts. From D-Day vets to jump jets. As a little lab, you go, mum, 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 can I have another fixed kit? Bloody fantastic. From legendary lifesavers to Edwardian flying machines. I've been told I can only fly it as high as I'm prepared to fall. But it can be an unpredictable business. If we have a catastrophic failure, then come and try and rescue us. You're taking off thinking, if the engine stops, we're even going to land. I mean, I've had three engine failures. It takes serious money. You need a cool three to six million pounds to get a good spare part. And total dedication. Minus 28. Some of the tools are freezing up. 15 minutes of holding a screwdriver. You can't feel your fingers. This time on Warbird Workshop. If it flew in 1911, it'll fly now. A ten-year quest. Be able to turn pieces of wood into a finished structure and to see it work, it's going to be a wonderful thing. The magnificent <coughs> men in their flying machine. To rebuild the first seaplane flown by the Royal Navy. I just can't wait to see the thing taking off. The future Prime Minister's pet project. Winston Churchill said that, frankly, there's war coming down the pipe and they had to um, do what they had to do. Takes off once again. Windermere, tranquil heart of the Lake District, where the only ripples are caused by the cabin cruisers. But 110 years ago, this was the place where a military revolution began. But very few people are aware that Windermere's aviation heritage started a long time ago, in 1911. The Edwardian Royal Navy was facing a growing threat from Imperial Germany and its fleet of dreadnoughts. German ships maneuver in the cold waters of the North Sea. But a young politician called Winston Churchill decided to bankroll a radical civilian experiment that could give our ships an eye in the sky. It was called Waterbird, and it became the testbed for the UK's first military seaplanes. Well, it's a part of history. It's the first successful seaplane in England. There were quite a number of aeroplanes that attempted to fly off water, but most of them crashed on trying to uh, return to it. Now, veteran engineer and warbird restorer Jerry Cooper is leading a £200,000 project, funded by a charity, to make Waterbird fly again. It was flown by a Navy, a Navy pilot, and, um, a serving naval officer, and uh, it was quite a successful aeroplane. It was destroyed by a gale in 1912. It's October 2010, and in a workshop in Lincolnshire, the first parts of an Edwardian flying machine are being machined by craftsman Mike Sales, who applied for a mysterious job. Initially, the job was, was advertised as um, cabinet maker, so I had no idea it was on an airfield or anything. I just said listening to him, so I had in my mind uh, making a, a nice piece of furniture for somebody. It's such a unique project that um, it's hard to give it a category, really. It's just, uh, I am his woodworker to do this plane, you know, simple as that. The fabric needs to wrap, you see. Yeah. So the fabric, the fabric will come over and around here. Mm -hmm. So that you'll be stitched. Be compression yeah. It shouldn't really part. Mike and engineer Jerry must guess some details of the plane. Just a matter of drilling holes through it and then, send, you know, setting it up. All right. As we're building this, we're building up test pieces as well so that um, we've got a test section of the main spa. We'll get, a, we'll get a design engineer to go through it with us and uh, when we submit his results to the Civil Aviation Authority and uh, hopefully they'll go along with us. I've already spoken to them and they said, start building. Luckily, we have an observer's book from World War I on how to, on how to put all these aeroplanes together. So they tell us an awful lot. The original Waterbird was built for Lakeland aristocrat and soldier Edward Wakefield by the Avro Company. 
Herbert Stanley Adams was its pilot. The aircraft they're recreating was 37 feet long and had a wingspan of 42 feet. Based on an American design, it used techniques that blended simplicity with strength. It's a wonderful thing. It just looks brilliant because it's 100 years old. Yeah, it's a very skeletal thing, much like the, the Wright brothers' plane with a massive float underneath it. And to be able to turn pieces of wood into a finished structure and to see it work, especially off the water, is going to be, uh, it's going to be a wonderful thing. You know? It's a labour-intensive operation. Each wing rib is cut from spruce and Douglas fir by hand. Six ribs ready. The team have only copies of a torn blueprint taking back a century to guide them. Um, in order to get enough or as many ribs as possible out of the large piece, a bit of a spruce we started with, uh, they're marked out with a template and a biro. Each piece is cut out vertically. It can then be cut horizontally to get six ribs out of each. Um, we've got about 60 ribs to make. That's the drawing. Shows it at certain intervals. Um, compression ribs are when two are paired up in this sort of fashion which is uh, glued in three sections to form a box. So it's a very strong beam, which carries the form of the, of the central part of the strut. We'll follow that exactly and give you the profile of the wing. The wing itself is made of two spars of the main uh, longitudinal beams. They have to have a series of slots routed. The ribs fit into the uh, routed slots on the I-beam, and the whole thing is glued together as one unit. It's June 2011, and in Jerry's hangar at Wickenby, among the more modern planes, the first parts of Waterbird are coming together for the first time. Well, what we're doing is setting up so that we, we know what, you know what the thing's going to look like, what the concept is, how everything fits together roughly, and it's just so that we can actually make sure that we, we've got the right idea and what we're putting together is going to, is going to make sense in the end. Basically. We need to get the thing all trimmed and everything so we do that on land um, because we'll be tensioning wires and we'll be moving things around. It'll be very difficult to do in water. And then we'll convert it or we'll convert it in here to take the floats and put the floats on it and then we'll take it to Lake Windermere. It's November in the lakes and Jerry and his wife Jenny have come to see the shore that was home to the original water bird and the waters where they'd like to fly the replica. We're looking at Hill of Oaks where it originally happened, okay, and the, the, just the, the history part of it, and uh, looking for a site with which we can uh, work with and get the thing airborne. Before the First World War, this was where British naval aviation was born and our first seaplane base was built. There was a lot more, lot of area clear for a start. There were none of these trees around, and the sheds were here. Um, so, it, you know, it's once you can see what 100 years has done, you know, it's just completely, completely almost obliterated the place. Jerry has been joined by lawyer and pilot Ian G, who heads up the charity paying for Waterbird's rebirth, and retired naval officer Adrian Legg. That's the original this wall there. Yeah. Um, this is this has had what hundred years, hundred years, hundred years to grow. Oh, too overgrown, but yeah, it, it's yeah. it's the walls. These are the ruins of Waterbird's hangar. Those are the structures that orientate yourself yeah. to yeah, yeah. the original uh, naval air station. Ian believes he and Jerry are following in the wake of Edward Wakefield and the pioneering pilot who was brought here to fly Waterbird. Herbert Stanley Adams was originally down at Brooklands, uh, where he had learned to fly there. And it was there that Edward Wakefield met him and brought him up here to this amazing adventure um, that he had no experience at all. So Jerry is the combination of that spirit um, and innovation uh, and his skills. All those things pulled together um, to be a repeat of what was done over a hundred years ago and it will be a wonderful experience and we're so very grateful for everything he's done. In the next few months, Jerry's team must cover Waterbird's wooden skeleton. It's all time, very time consuming, but very rewarding. And the descendants of the aviators 
who first flew it, come to visit the replica. This was where it began, and so it really is quite remarkable. It's almost a year since work on Waterbird started, and in Lincolnshire, Joyner Mike is recreating an Edwardian pilot's seat. It's steamed, you need to be quick because you've literally got a couple of minutes before you've got that give. Just glued up a series of um, three or four layers, the glue in between each. Aluminium, a piece of aluminium which is bent to the outside of the curve is then curved. So you've got the former on the inside, it's pulled round with the glue between each one. It's very strong, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. Waterbird didn't even have a seatbelt. And the charity is in an equally vulnerable position. Money is tight, and fundraisers have brought in TV news to publicise the appeal. Ian has invited three descendants of the original Waterbird's champion and two of its pilots to see the newly assembled skeleton. I'm here to introduce Tainworth, Lord Lieutenant of Lincolnshire, to Waterbird, because Waterbird was, was flown by his grandfather um, within a month of my Uncle Edward making the first successful seaplane flight of, in, in the British Empire. Within a month, the Navy were fascinated to, to see what was going on here. Sent their young Lieutenant Arthur Longmore to test it, and he was so pleased with it that uh, within two months, my great uncle Edward was um, in, contracted by the Royal Navy to produce floats. When Waterbird flew, Britain was three years after the start of the First World War. Without radar, the Royal Navy was blind to enemy shipping beyond the horizon. Winston Churchill decided that what he named a seaplane would give his admirals a crucial advantage. Back in the lakes, the arrival of the top secret military experiment was not popular with the area's most famous residents, including children's author Beatrix Potter. In the teeth of opposition from Beatrix Potter and Canon Rawnsley, who was founder of the National Trust, they, they, they put up 100,000 signatures, but Winston Churchill said that, frankly, there's a war coming down the pipe, and they had to, um, they had to do what they had to do. Then you have a wire from there out to that strut. Yep. My grandfather was sent by Winston Churchill to look at uh, the Waterbird, which was being built at that time, on Windermere, and to uh, take it off to fly it to see whether it would be suitable for the Royal Naval Air Service. Mad as chips, but you know, they had a lot of spirit about them. They all they wanted to do all these things. But it was it was very different in those days for people who would learn to fly because if the engine cut out whenever it was, well you, you could just sort of glide down and land in the nearest field. I think it's absolutely wonderful what he's been able to do with bits of spruce and bits of Douglas fir and, and uh, I just can't wait to see the fabric on there and all doped up and uh, the thing taking off. I was told that we needed to get some more money, but the money will turn up eventually. Where there's a will, there's a way, and it'll be, um, it'll be fantastic when it takes off. It's had a little bit of weight. I have my grandfather's original uh, flying license, which was number 72, and he lived to, to see a man go to the moon. So just quite sort of, almost you can't almost sort of take it in, and, and yet this was where it began. Today in the workshop, Jerry's rediscovering the skills Edwardian plane makers needed. Now that we've finished all the stress analysis and we've modified the structure to bring it up to modern standards, we're going to cover the top wing. We'll be using a modern fabric diatex, which is French, which will last at least 25 years. We'll start by laying the fabric across the top of the main plane, using the adhesive to stick it to the leading edge, and then we'll pull it and push it around until we get it laying nice and tidily on, on the surface. This material will be much more durable than the original covering in 1911. Then we will uh, heat shrink it uh, to get it in position and then we'll string it. After it's strung, we'll dope it, tape it, and put seven coats of uh, various dopes and things on it to uh, get it up to standard. It's a technique as old as aviation itself. Half engineering, half tailoring. What I'm doing now is I'm just measuring two inches in from the edge so that I can get a straight edge to stick it down. 
So I put adhesive from there to there, and then I'll, I'll stick it down. Then later when we turn the wing over, I'll, I'll finish turning that around the corner and sticking it and then trim it off. It's all time, very time consuming, but very rewarding. And you'll be surprised just how this actually stiffens up the structure. Five minutes and we're ready to turn. Waterbird was the product of an international race being led by the Americans to build a viable seaplane. One of the earliest and most successful competitors of the Wright was Glenn Curtis, who built and sold many airplanes to the Army. The Curtis Company, who influenced Waterbird's design, were struggling to get their planes off the water, despite funding from the US Navy. So British engineers extended Waterbird's wings by nearly six feet. You all right? It gave her more lift, but weakened her structure. Jerry's ironed out this design flaw. To you, to you, to you a bit. The bottom wings are exactly as it was built on the original at Avro. And the top wings, we've, instead of having a join here, in order to make it stronger, we've actually incorporated the five foot eight extension in the main plane itself. So the spars go all the way through to make it much stronger. We'll go through the same procedure on this side as we did for the other side and we'll get it set up um, ready for the back end of it to be strung tomorrow after, or to be sewn tomorrow afternoon. Back in Jerry's hangar, the wooden framework where the pilot sat is being put together to see if the centre section of the wing fits. We're going to try and assemble the, the centre section and put some bracing wires in it so that we know where we are and everything's level. And then we can start putting the centre section together because we've got all the tubes and things to go on and we've got, then we've got the centre piece to go in and all, all the undercarriage and things to put on it. When, when we start putting the wings on and that sort of thing, we, we need the whole thing level so that we can set up all the incidences of the wings and the dihedral and everything. Um, so it's... You have to have somewhere to start, and when you come to a biplane, if the centre section of the biplane is not square, nothing else is. Put it on there. If today goes badly, it could set them back weeks. You can give us a shove in a second, Dave. Well, OK, Dave. It's the moment of truth. Oh. The sockets built into the wing must fit the supporting struts precisely. How are we? Okay, that's it. Right, now you've got the front one there, Dave. Uh, on the top. Yes, okay, just a moment. I'll go around to the front. Yeah, okay, we've just got this, this, this one, this side is catching. So far, so good. Yes, yes. It fits. Only a minor correction is needed. We've got a fitting and, and the bolt goes through the spar and on the top there's a nut and a big washer. So we're actually hitting that we were hitting the bolts, not the actual wing. <laughs> so we were just all we were doing really was just was just tapping the brackets on. So all, all the force we put on it is always on the brackets as far as much as we can. Waterbird's strength will come from a web of wire cables supporting the wings. It's amazing, you know, when you look at a bridge. Um, with all the cross sections of a bridge, which take all the, all, the, all the stress and strain. They do the same thing in an aeroplane with wire. So you get like a very a bridge construction, but in, in wood and wire. Right, you need to tighten that one. In order to do this, every wire has to have a tensioner in it. And so we have them in all directions and we have to put the aeroplane together and with clinometers and straight edges and all this sort of thing, we have to make sure that everything is the same all the way through by tensioning up the turnbuckles to align it all. 69 and three quarters. All struck there, Dave, we'll try and get that one. The next cables we're going to do are the, uh, what we call the drag braces from the, the top to the bottom here. What happens is when the aeroplane is on the ground, the, these, these cables take all the weight of the wings, and th et cetera. Uh, when it's in flight, it's the ones from here up to the top here which take all the weight. We've got 200 metres of cable to go on it, and I don't think it's enough. <laughs> right, 69 and three quarters. This one just needs to go a little bit tighter. After five years, the heart of Waterbird is at last taking shape. An Edwardian flight of fancy come to life.
On the shores of Lake Windermere, the restoration team are trying to solve the mystery of the wooden float that made Waterbird revolutionary. It borrowed a trick used on early high-speed launches. It's the first time in the world that they used a step float and the big thing was the difficulty they had was to get the aeroplane to unstick um, from the water. So we need to know that, that will work and we're having the float specially designed and uh, the big thing is that the testing on the water and it will actually then take off and all come together. So, yeah, heart in mouth, really. The details of the float's construction are sketchy, but Lakeland boat builder James Pierce is using photographs and a blueprint to guide him. We've been building vessels for over 30 years, and so basically a float is, is a boat. A lot of the, the skills are transferable. The starting point was building a float that was as close to the original as possible in character, but our brief was that if there was anything we could do to either make it safer or to make it more suitable with modern techniques that weren't available back then, then it was worth doing. So the float has been uh, designed using uh, computer software so that we could create a, possibly a, a superior structure to the original. Then, out of the blue, there's an unexpected discovery. Amazingly, the original float has been gathering dust for 40 years in an annex of the RAF Museum. We have the lake's water bird, or the, the sole remains, that were donated to the museum in about 1971. They came from the Lord Wakefield estate, along with some other archive material. The float, which is probably the one in best condition, was on display for a short time at the RAF Museum at Hendon, which, once the, the full sort of display had been arranged, was taken off and stored. And it's been with us, along with its fellow spares or components, for some years now. We went down to the, the RAF uh, Museum where it's all been kept and we took our original measurements from the original float that is existing there, or what, what's left of it, um, to create the, the drawing for this. And something that we found quite interesting is that measuring things like the thickness of the side walls of the original float, it doesn't correlate with the dimensions that are in all the, the documentation of it. So, it, which makes you a bit sceptical about the weights that they said things were and possible all the overall weights of things as well. I think some of it might have been partly guesswork by the Admiralty when they did their, their testing. If something as basic as that is incorrect, what other problems await the team as they follow Edwardian plans and data that may not be accurate? It's, it's that long. It's only that long. Yeah, right, well, that would get... Probably, you know... And how wide? Uh, only 600 wide, so it's... Project leader Ian and fellow committee member Adrian have come to see work in progress. If the dimensions of the float are wrong, Waterbird could sink. This is where we're at anyway, so uh, at the moment it's, it's kind of tacked together. Yeah. I'm going to run glass tape around all... Because yeah. at the moment these aren't oh, joined. Yeah. Yeah. So I need to abrade the epoxy, yeah. epoxy fillet them, mm -hmm. glass fibre tape in, in all the joins. Yeah and probably just varnish all these just to make sure that if water ever does get in, yes. it won't just rot, uh -huh. or I should probably epoxy coat them. So um, where's Jerry going to be able to stand? What I'm going to do is basically build a deck which goes, yeah, it goes from the front to this frame. Yes. So it'll just be a two inch, so that'll mean all of these will be strong to stand on. Yeah. And if the float sprang a leak, the original water bird would have sunk to the bottom of Windermere. There were no watertight compartments. But James has modified the design to prevent this happening. We've decided to go for a fairly open construction, which will be completely watertight with the doped canvas top. A lot of people have been generous with their time for this project, but the problem is materials are quite expensive and, uh, you know, so getting the funding towards that is, is part of the, the battle. So there was a moment when I thought that things, you know, it was a dream of a, of a man that, you know, and it wouldn't happen. But uh, I'm very pleased to see that this has all come together. Back in Lincolnshire, Jerry and Jenny have begun coating the wings with dope, a specialist varnish. 
All I'm doing is stitching the edge of the wing, putting the two edges together and bringing the wire in so that I stitch the wire into the end of the wing so that when he dopes it, the wire doesn't disappear up through it and it's all attached into the end here. So all we do is come across this edge with basic blanket stitch and wire it all in. We're about to, to sail into this good old stringing campaign, which will take a while and which we really do love. <laughs> Jen sits one side, I sit the other, and we just pass it to and throw to one another. The dope tautens the fabric. The stitches stop it being ripped off by the air rushing past. Go on in. Hey? Yep. Yeah. Yes. We're really getting into it now, and we're you know we've only one more main plane to do. Everything from then on in is small, very small and very easy to look after. So. Lots of stitching for Jen, but uh, very easy for me. <laughs> it's spring, and it's a big day at the hangar. The propeller was designed and machined by computer, and Waterbird has been given some modern muscle. You want to hit it here? The engine arrived from Australia. This is a Rotec 2800, 110 horsepower. The original flew with 50, so we've given ourselves just a little bit of extra just in case. <laughs> Make sure the prop's right and goes on, and it does. Next thing we have to do now is to wire it all and put the filters in, tank tanks. Dave's doing tanks at the moment. One oil tank, one fuel tank, and then uh, start plumbing it all in. It's time to fit the outer wings for the first time too. Towards you a bit, Dave. Tops in, bottoms in. The shrinkage caused by doping fabric can pull wings out of shape. No, no, it just go back a bit. An accurate fit is critical. This whole left port side's got to be done the same manner as that with the struts and top wing. The large ailerons and the small ones have both got to be covered, yeah. Tight, tight, yeah, we're tight. Loosen it, loosen it. And that's it. Oh, well, that's got to pull up on that back one now to pull that in. That one? Yes. That's slack now, so that should go. So that one, that one needs to pull up now. You see, by tightening this one in, we've actually pulled this forward. Certainly, you can't help but be sort of impressed, but you know, when you see what it is, it really reflects the time it was designed and made. It looks like something from that period because it's been made to basic drawings, but it's still using their, their photographs and their, their drawings. So. You know, between my making the skeleton and Jerry and Johnny's covering the wings, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite impressive just to look at it, isn't it? It's half a decade ago, it's 2010, so for most of that time, it didn't really look like it was going to be funded and, and be completed, so it would be great to uh, see it come to fruition as a machine rather than just a handful of uh, poles and bits of material, you know. The next task is fabricating the bamboo poles that supported the control surfaces in front of the pilot, the canard as it's known. It's down to, to obtain the, the bamboo for these, these large triangular supports for the canard and the tailplane. Uh, tailplane's been made structurally but not covered yet, so they've, they've got to be done and lightened, hopefully. This is roughly where the canard will be when it's uh rigged properly. It's just basically an elevator, it's the front elevator. Normally elevators are on the back of an aeroplane, but on the early aeroplanes they put them on the front and they called it a canard. Jerry was planning to use modern aluminium for the canards, but a transatlantic trip changed his mind. It wasn't until um, I went to the Curtis Museum in America um, and talked to the people there that I'd found out you could still get this bamboo in long lengths. So we've gone through a whole load of tests with it. Um, bending, compression, etc., etc., and we find that um, we can use it. You would have thought that it would be difficult, but it was, I mean, they were doing it in 1910 and earlier, in fact. Um, so once you know the method, then that's, that's, then it becomes quite simple. Regulators at the CAA weren't so sure until Jerry supplied engineering calculations to prove it was safe. It's much lighter and much more rigid than the, than the other bamboo, the coastal bamboo for some reason. We discussed it with the design man and he likes this better. So this is what we're going to use. We've weighed each piece and they all, it all, it's all pretty much, much of a muchness. 
What we're trying to do is keep the, the weight of the aeroplane down. Because it's been stressed for a certain amount, we, we have to keep the weight within that, um, within that limit. So we're, we're, we're about five pounds underweight on an estimate so far, so that's why we're keeping it going like this. You have an idea now that the two of them are there. We need to get the brackets now, which are being, are being laser cut, in order to put them into the ends of here with wood. We'll, we'll get a wooden plug which will go in there with a slot in it. Bracket will go in and then we'll drill holes through it to hold it all together. It takes 3,000 PSI to crush it, all right, so um, it's quite strong. The team have also made and attached Waterbird's rudder. This is the tailplane it sits on. We have a, again, we have a load of bracing to put in here, which goes to the top of the rudder. And as you can see, the rudder is quite large and does its job quite well, really. But flying Waterbird from the waters of Windermere won't be easy. Flying an Edwardian seaplane is an art that is now forgotten. And after 50 years in the air, Jerry's had to go back to flying school. So I now have to get a seaplane rating on my licence, so consequently I'm off to Cardiff this afternoon, ready for an exam tomorrow, and then I can do the flying afterwards, and that's the end of it, then getting on my licence. So. Because you're able, to, you're able to land on water, and you need to know who has the right of way. Um, and funnily enough, seaplanes right at the bottom of the list, so, <laughs> so you give way to everybody. Waterbird's first flight is ebbing closer. At Wickenby, the team have reached another major milestone. Ian and Adrian have arrived with the last missing components. Cushion just to your left, Jerry. This morning is the momentous stage we have in our project for the delivery of the float. On the trailer this morning, we've brought the float and an enormous uh, drawbar because the drawbar has to be long enough to clear the, uh, the elevator at the front of the aircraft. So it's a, it's a very long piece of kit. The float has been built by uh, James over in Ambleside. So it fits exactly, locks onto the, uh, the wooden sections of the trolley. And the idea is the whole aircraft will be launched down the slipway on this bogey. Ready, Lazar. Here we go. The step needs to go by that piece of wood. Making sure the float fits and they can launch the aircraft is vital preparation for her arrival at Windermere. Age of Miracles not yet passed, you know. That's approximately where it goes. Approximately. Right. Now let's have a look at this piece. This is principally the last piece in, in the jigsaw. And it's the largest of the, the pieces remaining. And uh, we can now actually imagine how the whole thing might eventually look like. Ian believes the project would have the full support of the pioneers who built Waterbird. I would like to think that, you know, if they were looking down, that, uh, that they would well approve of what we're about and what we're achieving to celebrate what they achieved. Jerry's brought in his assistant, Remus, to fine tune the modern okay. engine and its 21st century electronics. Two magnetos and start. Push bottom for starting, to start engine. Nothing important. Very easy. Things are going along quite well. The floats arrived and we're just finishing off the last of the small modifications we've had to do. Consequently, things are progressing quite well at the moment. Um, I should think by next weekend, we'll be finishing off here, hopefully. But Jerry has an unexpected trip to take before he can fly Waterbird from Windermere. He must learn how to take off and land on water, tuition only available in Italy. We're the only country in the world which asks for seaplane pilots to have a Seamaster certificate. So the only place left in Europe was Lake Coma. So we made all the arrangements, turned up there. By four o'clock in the afternoon, I'd done three hours flying. I was kind of totally shattered. And then nine o'clock Thursday morning with the examiner. So by 10 o'clock, I had a seaplane radar. Absolutely shattered. Three steps forward, two back.
It's September 2015, and five years after the first wood was cut, Waterbird is rolled out for the first time. Finally outside, it doesn't look as big as it does inside the hangar, does it? It looks a lot smaller. Waterbird is to be test flown from wheels. It's safer than trying to take off from water. The aim this morning is to run, make sure everything's happening as it should. Um, we might have a little problem with one of the circuits on the magneto side, but we can fix that. But just to make sure the engine runs, those magnificent men in their flying machines, they go hoppity up, 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 they go down, flying around. Steps. It's time to fire her up. And with no brakes, there's no stopping Waterbird. But immediately, there's a hitch. Fuel doesn't seem to be reaching the cylinders. What's next is to get it back in the hangar and then start on all the little problems the design engineers have left for us again, and that's it. So there we go, we'll just get on with it. It's been a disappointing first run, and the next few weeks bring more bad news. CAA engineers are concerned about the strength of Waterbird's structure and want to examine the plane again. We're getting close to the wire now. At the moment, we're a little bit perturbed, and we'll find out about this tomorrow because they're now suggesting that if we put a float on this aeroplane, the, um, the stress loads on landing on water will be very high because it's solid. So that they're now a little bit concerned about it, but we'll talk about that tomorrow when they turn up and see what they have to say about all that. It means that they, you know, we either completely redesign the aeroplane uh, or we are going to have to restress the aeroplane. Um, I don't know which way they're going to go yet. Um, so we'll keep plodding on and getting as far as we can and then see what happens. Um, we'll hopefully fly it as a land plane whilst they get together if they need to, to um, see what we're going to do about sorting out the float plane side of it. It's just another fight with, with authority. And I've got a drawer full of bollocks, so I'm not that worried about it. <laughs> the team are taking the opportunity to adjust the controls of Waterbird. was one of the first aircraft to have the control surfaces that still steer aircraft today. Rudder, ailerons, and an elevator. Still a bit more. That's good, that one. It's vital they move smoothly. Jerry's life could depend on it. You okay there? That's, that's running fine now. That's beautiful. We're now setting up the, aileron, the rudder control, and then we have to line everything up so that it doesn't jump off the pulleys and things. You know, it will be, it's beginning now to take shape. If you tuck one edge, one, one edge in and hold it, tuck one, 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 one edge in. The, one, one end in. That's it. The big thing will be to, to, to taxi it around, taxi it, make sure it'll maneuver when it's and it's responsive to the rudder, um, and get it on get it on the runway or, or on a piece of grass, then accelerate it, um, and then just gently lift, just gen gently keep lifting and see if we can lift the nose and how much response there is in, in the canard. And just gradually progress faster and faster until hopefully at some stage it leaves the ground. I've got to the stage now, I want to get it done again on with something else, <laughs> because this is now taking up all our time. It's a landmark day at Wickenby. After eight years of work, they're going to try to fly Waterbird. We've got to attempt to get some air between the wheels and the ground. I've been told I can only fly it as high as I'm prepared to fall. Um, and that's what we're going to do. It's nice to see it finished. I mean, before it was just a load, just the framework sitting on top of the shelf. That was what, two years worth of work went straight on the shelf. So we've got another, well, it's best been best part of a year now, putting it together like this. And so we actually have an aeroplane here now, for better or for worse. 
we brought in billets of wood and, and every component in this was sawed out. So it's been a long job that way. I'm quite happy with it. You know, I'll, um, I'm quite happy with my workmanship and I'm quite happy with the design. If it flew in 1911, it'll fly now. There's no crash protection and Jerry's relying on controls that may not work below 40 miles an hour, if at all. Okay, so is on, that's on, master on. Clear? Yeah. Well, what we do first, we'll fire it up, you know, tax it around on the grass a little bit just to make sure, you know, that it's, uh, everything's ackling properly. And then we'll do a low power run. Another little hop across the runway down the bottom end and then turn around and then once because there's no wind we can come either way any direction so and just keep going. The sight of a 107 year old plane on the runway is drawing a crowd. Jerry's confidence is growing. He's lining up for takeoff. Jerry's airborne. Now he must use all his experience to come down again without wrecking the plane or himself. And he pulls off the happiest of landings. It's a big relief for the pilot and his wife. That was super. I like. I actually enjoyed watching that fly. That was lovely. We've had to have a few alterations along the way, but we've overcome them, and tonight is an example of it. The guys have been unbelievable, OK? What they have pulled together and to do it is, is, is well, words cannot describe the effort that they've put into it. Jerry's belief in it and also Ian G's belief in it has been second to none. And without that belief, they wouldn't have done what they've done. It's testament to the guys that have built it all the way along. It's a culmination of a long time and a lot of, a lot of aggravation, but uh, there it is. There's quite a lot of aileron control on it so that you can't, you know, you can actually feel it wants to turn and it wants to do all these things. This is what's the annoying part, is because it's so, it looks so fragile, um, people turn around and say, oh, that never fly, and it doesn't, but it does, it does, and it flies fantastically and it's responsive, it does everything it's supposed to do. So, you know, fantastic. I feel great because it's showing them all their hard work actually works, you know, and that's 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 it. I mean, the carpenter did all the woodwork on it, and then um, Rimmers did all the engine and electric side of it. It's vindication of a, of, of a lot of down ha ha ho ho stuff, you know. But uh, it'll never fly, uh, but now it does. So I'm going to go home with a gin and tonic, I think. <laughs> Eleven years after the first piece of wood was planed. Waterbird is prepared for a journey back to Windermere, where she first made history. After a series of funding problems and technical difficulties, this year it's hoped she will finally fly from water, the finale of an incredible endeavor.